The New Studies in Biblical Theology series of monographs by D.A. Carson explores key issues in biblical theology. It is mainly focused on three areas, understanding the nature and status of biblical theology, examining the thought structure of specific biblical writers or texts, and tracing a biblical theme across various parts of the Bible. These works are aimed at helping Christians better understand the Bible, striving to edify and instruct by engaging with scholarly literature. However, they are designed to be accessible, avoiding technical jargon and untranslated Greek and Hebrew. Written within the framework of confessional evangelicalism, they attempt to thoughtfully engage with a wide range of relevant materials. The challenge of organizing an overview of the Old Testament is noted, particularly in balancing faithfulness to historical context and literary genre with the overall Christian canon. Dr. Stephen Dempster is recognized as a guide in this aspect, offering a fresh and provocative reading of the Old Testament storyline. Though acknowledging the possibility of alternative organizational methods, his insights are considered helpful and likely to inspire sermons and lectures. The series emphasizes the importance of a whole Bible theology, eine gesamtbiblische theology, as opposed to focusing solely on the Old or New Testament. In a cultural context where narrow and fragmented thinking is common, Dr. Dempster's volume serves as a corrective, advocating for a more comprehensive understanding of theology. Also, Dempster's preface to his work reflects his journey and exploration into the Hebrew Bible. Initially focusing on the details, a 1993 sabbatical led him to study the general contours of the text. He aimed to understand the overall structure and interpretive strategies within the Hebrew canon, a process that resulted in various studies and the development of the current book. Dempster thanks many colleagues and friends for their advice and support in his project, including the editor, Don Carson, Philip Dutz from IVP, and various scholars who provided expertise, critical insights, and encouragement. Moreover, he acknowledges the prayers and support from close friends and family, specifically his parents, who first introduced him to the biblical narrative. He offers his gratitude to his children for their patience and acknowledges God's strength and grace in completing the project. Furthermore, he dedicates the book to his wife, Yehudit, expressing his deep appreciation. In addition, Dempster's view on biblical theology challenges the notion that it is a discipline that can escape subjectivity by showing how it's been influenced by the theologian's own perspectives. While it might seem more manageable to distinguish what the text meant from what it means, around 60 different biblical theologies in the last century reveal that each interpretation often leads to a unique theology. The variance arises from different lenses used by theologians. Diachronic historical lenses focus on chronological sequences of divine saving events but overlook ongoing divine activity. Systematic lenses categorize textual material through concepts from dogmatic theology like God, humanity, and salvation. Thematic lenses may concentrate on indigenous biblical concepts but miss other central themes, while existential lenses reflect the interpreter's own concerns. Dempster argues that this shouldn't lead to postmodern cynicism. Instead, theologians must navigate between the extremes of modernism, characterized by objectivism, believing that a subject can see the whole truth of an object, and postmodernism, defined by subjectivism, seeing the object based on personal perspective, never as it truly is. A genuinely Judeo Christian epistemology will steer between these extremes. Humans can know the truth as it's revealed, but it's always tailored to their understanding and filtered through their unique context. Influences of culture, place, time, society, education, experience, and sin all tint the truth. Dempster cites Paul's observation to the Corinthian church, illustrating that believers see through a glass darkly in life, embracing the truths of both modernism and postmodernism, but avoiding their errors. This approach recognizes the ability to see modernism, but acknowledges the limitations of understanding through a glass darkly, postmodernism. Further, Dempster's insight on postmodernism explores how human beings interpret the world through unique lenses. This diversity of perspectives, rather than hindering understanding, can contribute to a better comprehension of reality, as demonstrated by various interpretations of the Synoptic Gospels. However, this doesn't mean that all readings of a text are equally valid. The assertion that all perspectives are legitimate can lead to hermeneutical solipsism, a dangerous path. 
Anderson provides a corrective to this by accentuating that an appropriate reading of a text is one faithful to its genre and structure. Dempster illustrates this point with extreme examples, like the interpretations of the Old Testament attributing events to alien technology. These interpretations impose alien frameworks, which are not appropriate readings of the text. The line between normal and alien interpretations is becoming blurred, with scholars offering different, sometimes controversial readings of the biblical text. Besides, the importance of reading the text in a way that's appropriate to its genre and structure is affirmed. This understanding is intuitively recognized in other professions, like the difference between the tools used by a brain surgeon and a carpenter. Consequently, the function of the text should guide interpreters, and the lens through which it is read must be acquired through constant exposure to the text. Dempster encourages readers to steep themselves in the text's tone or temper to understand its overall message, becoming familiar with its contours, poetic details, wordplays and distinctive logic. This process is likened to explorers mapping a new territory, requiring painstaking examination, reading and rereading to make the most accurate understanding. The hermeneutical rule of the analogy of faith asserts understanding individual passages in light of the whole text, a comprehension attainable only through repeated readings of its individual parts. Additionally, Dempster delves into the conceptualization of the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. He highlights that it was not initially a single book, but a collection of scrolls stored together. Dempster refers to Barr and Barton, who discuss the unity of these texts, indicating that viewing them as a unified book might be a later concept. Barr maintains that these scrolls were individual pieces, often kept in a specific location, and the boundary between Holy Scripture and other sacred texts was difficult to delineate. Dempster, however, contends that physical division does not necessarily mean conceptual disunity. The Pentateuch, for example, was written on separate scrolls, but its sequence was crucial for interpretation, and thematic devices ensured unity. Also, he points out how ancient Mesopotamian texts maintained conceptual unity despite physical separation, referring to the creation epic and epic of Gilgamesh. These were inscribed on multiple clay tablets, but kept in a fixed sequence to maintain their coherence. Upon finalization of the canon, physical unity was created through the grouping and specific ordering of the canonical books. Dempster debates that despite the physical division, the Hebrew Bible is not prevented from being a cohesive text. Yet, some believe it's challenging to find any literary and thematic unity that binds the many texts into one text, due to the diverse authors and genres spread over a millennium. Fry's description of the Bible as a mosaic reiterates this diversity, but also recognizes that it does not preclude unity. Dempster acknowledges that the Hebrew Bible, or Tanakh, was seen as a unity for theological reasons, but questions if this unity is artificial or literary. He observes conceptual unity, despite the literary heterogeneity, citing a structural homogeneity that frames the vast array of texts within a comprehensive narrative. From creation to the exile and return of the Jewish people, the texts form a cohesive framework, giving meaning to the individual parts within the larger context of the Old Testament. Moreover, Dempster repeats the intricate connections and relationships among different parts of the Bible, particularly in the context of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible. The individual stories, such as those in the Book of Judges, are seen as parts of a larger national and universal story that stretches from Genesis to Chronicles. The positioning of these narratives within a grand framework has substantial hermeneutical implications. For instance, starting the Tanakh with Genesis instead of Exodus places Israel's national history within a larger world history context. It signifies that Israel's existence and purpose are connected to God's broader goals for creation. The order of the books provides critical historical context, such as the positioning of judges before Samuel, giving insight into the rise of kingship and the placement of Ruth with its genealogical conclusion connecting it to the overall biblical narrative. Furthermore, the inclusion of poetic literature, like the prophets, provides essential theological commentary and breaks the main narrative line from Genesis through Kings. Reading these texts in isolation may lead to misunderstandings, such as seeing the prophets only as preachers of repentance. Reading them in their literary context, however, offers a more nuanced understanding, like interpreting the experience of exile as judgment 
while simultaneously recognizing the future's possibilities, as symbolized in passages like Isaiah 6, 13 and 11. 1. Dempster's argument reinforces the importance of reading the Bible's books in their intended sequence and literary context, recognizing them as interrelated parts of a coherent whole, each contributing to a deeper understanding of God's plan for humanity. In addition, Dempster underlines the importance of a literary approach to understanding the Bible, disputing that it is not merely a religious text, but a work of literature that demands careful reading and interpretation. Since 1965, scholars like Good have urged readers to approach the Bible as they would other literary works, such as The Divine Comedy or Othello. Despite its literary characteristics, the Bible remains unique because it is also considered God's Word. Unlike other literary works, the Bible's claim to truth is tyrannical, and its understanding is vital, not just for its literary merit, but for its sacred content. Some scholars stress that ignorance of the Bible's literary features can lead to misunderstandings, as seen in both theological right and left fundamentalism, where the text is often used to endorse contemporary cultural fads. Dempster underscores that the Bible is a complex text containing various aspects of human nature and divine judgment. Understanding the Bible as a literary whole offers a broader perspective on themes such as human depravity, divine judgment, and saving grace. By studying the Bible as a literary work, one can gain appreciation for the narrative and poetic art of its authors, enhancing the meaning of the text. A literary approach allows for a deeper understanding of different genres and their implications within the Bible. It helps readers discern the appropriate way to read various texts, such as parables, poems, or visions. This approach emphasizes the importance of understanding not only the individual texts, but also the overall message of the Bible. Dempster's argument fosters a balance between seeing the Bible as a literary masterpiece and recognizing its sacred nature. He accentuates that readers should take pleasure in reading the Bible as literature while understanding its serious implications. Such an approach validates and sanctifies the interpretive task, making the comprehension of the Bible imperative for believers and scholars alike. Further, Dempster's argument revolves around the perception of the Bible as a unified text or a disparate collection of texts. He criticizes a viewpoint that regards the Bible as an anthology without coherence, suggesting that this contradicts generations of readers who have seen it as a unified whole. Dempster affirms that the history of interpretation has often faced a failure to grasp the whole picture, resulting in misunderstandings. He uses Jesus' teachings and the discussion of Mosaic law to illustrate the need for seeing the whole context and not just individual laws or instructions. He acknowledges that discerning the unity of the Bible is difficult due to its vast diversity. Many scholars have even concluded that literary unity is an illusion. Dempster contends that this lack of perception is not just a result of the complexity of the text, but also the hermeneutical approach over the last few centuries. He points to a diminishment in the belief that the Bible is the Word of God and the enchantment with the minute details as reasons for losing the wider perspective. Using the analogy of photography, Dempster describes how zooming in on the minute details can cause one to lose sight of the big picture. He laments the rise of historical criticism and its contribution to a fragmented understanding of the text. By contrast, using a wide-angle lens allows for noticing the unity and intricate design in various narratives, like the flood story or the structure of the Pentateuch. He notes the overemphasis on philology and history as factors in misreading the text and asserts the purposeful pattern within the Bible. Alter's literary studies are cited to debate that a wider angle of vision can reveal an astonishingly well-made unity in the biblical text. Dempster's thesis suggests that viewing the Hebrew Bible with a wide-angle lens will reveal its interconnected unity rather than a textual patchwork. He sees the pre-modern tradition as more capable of recognizing this pattern due to its assumption that the Bible was a unified entity. His argument serves as a call to approach the Bible with an understanding of its holistic framework, rather than fragmenting it into isolated sections. Besides, Dempster's analysis highlights the textual coherence within the Bible and the conscious unity across its various books. He indicates evidence pointing towards a canon consciousness, an awareness that individual books belonged to a larger whole. He discusses historical factors, citing how the books of the Bible were seen as a unity despite technological limitations, 
such as the use of scrolls that could only contain one or few books. The belief in a single divine author, God behind the human authors, contributes to the idea of the books as a conceptual unity. This notion is illustrated by references to ancient texts and expositions that affirm the harmony and divine nature of the texts. Within the biblical text, Dempster recognizes a rich intertextuality with linguistic and conceptual echoes that link the scriptures. He points to patterns such as creation, exile and return, as well as minor details that exhibit similar themes across different books. The final compilers also ensured the text was understood as a unity, with major groupings, editorial splices, and theologically driven literary points connecting different sections. Additionally, Dempster dives into the significance of the order of the books, reflecting on the stress of maintaining a specific sequence. He considers various reasons for this order, acknowledging that some may seem artificial, but serve to preserve and convey meaning. He disputes that this order is far from arbitrary, and suggests a hermeneutical significance, maintaining that different arrangements generate different meanings. Dempster's examination ultimately points out that the unity of the Bible's text is both a literary and theological construction. The coherence across its books demonstrates a deliberate design, reflective of a broader conceptual framework where all parts work in harmony with a single divine authorship. This unity, he argues, has a profound influence on interpretation and comprehension of the scriptures as a whole. Also, Dempster addresses a literary approach to understanding the Bible, focusing on the Old Testament, also known as the Tanakh. He contends that Christians often let the New Testament dominate the interpretation of the Old Testament without deeply engaging the latter. Dempster cites Bonhoeffer's caution against rushing to the New Testament, reiterating the importance of considering the Old Testament in its own context. The text is named the Tanakh and consists of three main subdivisions, the Torah, the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings. Dempster repeats that many scholars have used literary analysis for interpreting smaller units of texts, but rarely at the level of the entire text. This is considered an oversight, since a literary approach can reveal the overall message or central theme, which aligns with the goal of biblical theology. The task of biblical theology, according to Dempster, is to describe the conceptual unity of the biblical text. Some scholars have given up on this task, assuming multiple theologies rather than one. The concept of a unified book and author has been lost. Dempster suggests that if a clear literary cohesion and explicit unity can be demonstrated, biblical theology may gain new relevance. Dempster refers to the work of Gitte, who has applied principles of classical rhetoric to understand biblical texts. Gitte's approach assumes that the authors were interested in communication and understanding their principles aids in interpreting texts. Jitai also advocates applying these insights to understanding the entire Bible text. Dempster concludes by recognizing the potential fruitful interface between biblical theology and literary analysis and expressing his intention to use this method to explore themes in the Old Testament. Moreover, the structure of the Tanakh has been a subject of debate and study among theologians and scholars. Many Christian Old Testament theologians, such as Gunnaweg, have not seen the structure as having positive relevance for biblical theology, often associating it with a legalistic understanding and contrasting it negatively with the New Testament. Others, like Clements, acknowledge the priority of law, but also stress the promise explicit in the prophetic division, lamenting the habitual examination of the Bible as isolated texts instead of a cohesive literary whole. Westerman, however, takes the tripartite structure of the Tanakh seriously, organizing his theology around the Torah, prophets and writings, underlining their unique attributes and importance in understanding the Old Testament. However, some scholars overlook the Tanakh as a single text rather than three, often neglecting the third section, the writings. Jewish scholar Friedman and others like Friedman and Sailhammer have underscored the literary integrity of the Tanakh, advocating for a view that looks at the whole text, observing its unity and design. They debate that it is not just a collection, but a single text with a clear beginning and end, and explore how it is divided into two halves that emphasize different themes. Childs notes the narrative frame of the text, but does not dig deep into its significance. Miles, in contrast, examines the narrative structure for understanding the gradual revelation of the identity of God, 
wrestling with the significance of the narrative breaks and divine speech. Furthermore, Sweeney explores the differences between the canonical arrangements of the Christian Old Testament and Hebrew Tanakh, accentuating how the structure of the Tanakh affirms ethics, while the Christian arrangement asserts eschatology. Some of his conclusions are considered debatable. The growing interest in considering the Bible as one literary unit, spurred by literary critics like Fry, reinforces the argument that the macro structure of the Tanakh has substantial implications for biblical theology. It shapes the understanding of the text and influences the way both the Old and New Testaments are interpreted within Western thought. Last but not least, Dempster's discussion on canonization and contextualization provides a nuanced insight into how the biblical canon is formed and interpreted. He addresses resistance to the idea that the biblical canon has unity, as it contrasts with contemporary scholarship's view that the canon is a historical accident filled with contradictory voices. Barr's writings are cited, disputing that a single text for the canon would have been unthinkable in biblical times due to technological limitations. However, Dempster highlights that canonization does create a unified text from many, as Gamble remarked, abstracting them from their original settings to create a new literary whole. This process infers unity and coherence, enabling a synoptic reading that changes the individual meaning of the documents. In addition, Dempster explains how the positioning of books within the canon changes their interpretation and reveals theological implications. The Gospel's position grants them priority, and the arrangement of other books affects their understanding within the larger text. This presumption of unity allows readers to approach the text with a hermeneutic of charity, seeing each part in relation to the whole. Dempster elaborates that the design of the Tanakh offers a hermeneutical lens through which the content can be seen. Canonization creates one text from many, without flattening the text into uniformity. Instead, it allows evolution, diversity and growth within an overarching framework. This literary theological approach is promising for discovering fundamental themes and responsible hermeneutics. Gerhard von Rad's statement is quoted to indicate the nature of the Old Testament as a saving history from creation to the end of times. Dempster concludes by maintaining the Bible as a remarkable story that assimilates all texts into its comprehensive framework, beginning at the beginning. The discussion challenges the idea that the Bible is merely a collection of disparate parts, promoting instead a unified and coherent reading. In conclusion, the series New Studies in Biblical Theology by D. A. Carson aims to enhance understanding of central theological themes and concepts in the Bible. The series reiterates the importance of examining the Bible as a complete entity rather than focusing on individual parts. Dr. Stephen Dempster, in his work, advocates for this comprehensive approach, offering a fresh understanding of the Old Testament. His scholarly journey in understanding the Hebrew Bible led him to explore its general structure and interpretive strategies. Dempster challenges the belief in absolute objectivity in biblical theology showing how it is inevitably influenced by the theologian's perspectives. This resultant diversity can enhance comprehension, as demonstrated by the various interpretations of the synoptic Gospels. However, not all readings of the text are equally valid. Dempster argues that understanding should be guided by the function of the text and constant exposure to it. The concept of the Old Testament as a unified text underpins Dempster's analysis. Despite its division into various books, he contends that the Hebrew Bible maintains a cohesive unity. Viewing the Bible as a whole affords valuable insight into intertextual connections and relationships among its varying parts. Further, Dempster repeats the significance of a literary approach to understanding the Bible, debating for a balance between seeing it as a literary masterpiece and recognizing its divine nature. Besides, he addresses the coherence within the Old Testament, disputing against the view of it as an anthology lacking unity. Finally, Dempster's analysis examines the canonization and contextualization of the Bible, elucidating how textual coherence was maintained despite having multiple authors and varying literary genres.